Amen and amen. It's good to be back this morning. Somebody uh, saw me this morning and said, I saw you shaved off your mustache. Is that uh, for a new beginning? And the truth is, is no. Um, I was snorkeling this week, and I'd had the stuff on my mask to try to keep from drowning. You remember a couple weeks ago when I talked to you about baptism, how that represented death? Uh, wearing that mask with my mustache very much represented death because it filled up with water. And uh, so I shaved it off so that I could, uh, could do that differently. But it is good to be back with you this morning. Um, this morning I'd like to, um, have you ever been lost? I, I don't mean spiritually lost. Now that's, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But have you ever wandered off somewhere to where you, uh, I have, you know, personally in my adult life driving, I have never been lost. Uh, I've been many places that I didn't exactly know where I was right then. But I drove on till I found out that there was something that was around me I knew. But this morning, I'd like for you to stand with me as we talk about uh, a very familiar passage, one that you will know. Would you stand with me as I'm reading God's Word? From the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, hear these words. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes, were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Skipping it on verse 11. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine, a famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. Now he would have gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father, but while he was still afar off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe and the best one. Put, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came home and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. And he replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because you've gotten him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years, sounds familiar somehow, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never get, even given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And then the father said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I grew up on a farm out in the country. Back in those days, uh, it's, it, when I tell my grandchildren about uh, living in those days, we didn't get a, a, a yard light until I was older. And it was when it got dark, it was dark, unless the moon came up. 
And we would, back then, I mean, it was just, it, you just moved around and, and, uh, and when a lightning storm came, it would just light up. I mean, you could see it all. It reminds me of a story about a little boy that went out to stay with his grandparents out on the, their farm one day and there's this huge thunderstorm came up and the little boy was a little bit afraid of thunderstorms and he said uh, came in and said grandma god must have lost somebody and his grandmother said well why in the world would you say that and he said because he's looking for them with his flashlight so <laughs> that was a good way of trying to put that face on that somebody's lost and god is looking for them one of the things that uh, when my girls were little they used to have this game and it used to drive deborah crazy that the oldest one was especially bad. We would go into uh, Belk's or uh, Kmart or one of those stores, and our oldest daughter, when she was little, I hope I'm not giving anybody any ideas, but she would go in those clothes on those circular racks, and she would run up in the middle of them and hide there and just peep out. Uh, you know. And so now we're freaking out because we can't find her. She's lost. Now, she knows exactly where she is, but to us, she's lost. And so we're, we're just panicked trying to find her. And, and when you find her, you want to you wanna kill her, but you know that that's abuse, so you don't want to do that. And you're glad you found her and you love her, and so you don't want to do that. So, so you're caught in that place, you know, that uh, you're just relieved that they're found. But have you ever been lost? I mean, have you truly ever been so broken? Have you ever been so dislocated that it was a long way, way back to anywhere from where you are? Now, some of you sitting here this morning, there is brokenness in the world all around us. And folks are lost, I guess, to different degrees. Several years ago, Deborah and I were on a cruise, uh, and we came back. One of the stops we stopped in was Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. It's a beautiful town, and when we got off the ship, one of the things they said to us, now, whatever you do, there's this place in town. You don't want to be in that place in town. Don't go there. It's a dangerous place. Lots of stuff going on. Don't go there. And so I, I said to our little group that I was leading, I said, you know what, I, I'd like to go down to Stanley Park. It was on the other side of the city, a beautiful place and just a, in, incredible. And they said, how are we going to get there? And I said, let's ride the bus over there. How hard could it be to find our way around? Now, those are famous last words. I want you to listen to that. How hard could it be to get around? So we ride over to Stanley Park, and it's an easy trip over there. And so we get finished with our little tour of Stanley Park, uh, and so we start back, and we, we ask the bus driver, how do we get back to the port? I don't know. I don't know which bus goes back over there. But ride with me, and, we'll, and so we'll ask the next person we'll know. And so we got on the bus, and we rode up, and, and we're pushed for time because the ship's going to leave. How do we get back to the port? I don't know, but ride with me, and we'll find somebody that can get you there. We even found two policemen arresting somebody and said to them, how do we get back to the port? And they said, we don't know which bus line will take you back there. But finally, we got on a bus that um, the guy said, I think, I think if you'll ride it up to this street and get off, you can get back to the port. So we're, we get up, and, and so I'm panicked about, you know, I, I want to do a good job. And I got off two stops before I should have gotten off. When we stepped off that bus, we stepped off into the part of town that they had told us to avoid at all costs. Not to go there. Folks, there were folks, they were selling drugs. They were selling them out in the open. There were uh, people, uh, prostitutes. I mean, it was, just, it was just incredible, all the things. And so we're scared to death. And so the little group that I'm with, you know, I'm their leader. And I'm, their, you know, I'm the person that got them in this mess, and I'm going to get them out. And so I said to them, I'm going to walk ahead of you, and if they attack, you all hold them off, and I'll run for help. So you all just hold them off until I can get some help back. <laughs> But as we was walking up through there, I saw a young lady sitting on the street. It couldn't have been much more than 23, 24, 25 years old. And as I, we were walking by her now, we're all scared to death, and, and she's combing her hair. There's, it's obvious that she's getting ready to go out for the evening. But as I began to look at her, I noticed there, it wasn't hard to see it. There were needle marks all over her, starting between her toes going up her feet, going up her legs, and even up to where her skirt was, there were needle marks up her legs. And I remember as I walked by her, I looked at her, and, and she looked up, and I've never seen such a hollow look in my life. I mean, this young woman sitting up, it was almost like, can you help me? But I was on my way trying to get out of there. I didn't stop. 
I got on, we got back on the ship, and we were just so relieved that we'd made it back on that ship, back to the safety of, of sailing away from there. And I didn't sleep a wink that night. I didn't sleep a wink because the thought came into my mind, I wonder if her mother and daddy knows where she is. I wonder if she could ever go home again. And I wrestled with that all night long. I wonder if I could have done something that day, maybe to offer her a word of hope. I wonder, I wonder. But, and see, there's nothing that I could do because I'm gone. I doubt I would ever see her again. But in that young woman's mind, there was such brokenness that she had gone away from home. And I wonder if she ever thought she could ever go back. This parable this morning that we talk about, it reaches us on so many different levels, on so many levels of which that we are, are lost. Some of us are maybe, we may be struggling with our relationship with God. First and foremost in our life that we have, we have just said no to God and, and we're lost. We have never made that for a confession to God. I am, uh, God forgive me. There are some of us sitting here that, that we say, well, gosh, that's, that's a terrible thing. But there's also other terrible things that go with that is that there's brokenness and we're lost from the relationships that are around us that are important to us. Children, family, brothers and sisters, all those things. You see, this parable this morning represents something that is really, really important in our faith, and that is freedom. That is freedom. The ability to say yes or no to God. But it's not just to God that we say yes or no. We say yes or no to one another and to those that we love. Now, I have to tell you this morning that as I read this parable, I, I construct in my mind a picture. And the terrible thing about this is, is that this father is compassionate. He's grace, filled with grace. And this youngest son, uh, initially, when you read this, here's what he's actually saying to his father. He's saying to him, Father, I want my inheritance now. And literally what he's saying to his dad is, I want you to die. I, I don't, I don't, you don't have to live anymore because all I want from you is what's due me is my inheritance. That's all I want. What a selfish, selfish person that must take to be that cold and that callous to say to that father, I just want what's mine. And the father risked something that every parent risks every time they let a child go. He said, all right, son, you, you get to make your own decision. You get to do what it is that you want to do. I'm going to let you do it. And I'm going to give you what your heart, what you think your heart desires. Here it is. Several years ago, Everybody loves the Andy Griffith series, young and old alike. Several years ago, I remember one of those episodes where the Opie sees a mother bird, and he's got a slingshot, and he shoots the mother bird and kills her. And what he doesn't know is that there's these little birds have hatched in a nest that's just right outside his bedroom window. He goes to bed that night, and those little birds are chirping out there. They're hungry, and his, his conscience is so filled that he, he goes and he he gathers up the little birds and puts them in a cage, and for the next while, he raises those birds until they're ready to leave the nest. And so he's struggling. Should I let them go? Should I let them have their freedom? It's easier to take care of them if they're in the cage. But Andy convinces him to let those little birds go, and when, they let, when they're gone, he says to Andy, uh, Andy says, what do you think? And he said, that cage sure does seem empty. But Andy says, yeah, but the trees, aren't they full? So often we put ourselves in a cage without allowing ourselves the freedom to act with common decency and kindness so that we set ourselves up to be captives of our own devices. God gives you and I the same freedom that this father gave to his son. We have the ability to say yes or no to God. On every level, at every step of our life, we say yes or no. But I think it's wonderful that God devised a plan that in case we said no, there was a plan that we might return. 
that we might come back. One of the things that I find about human beings is we're, we're a little less tolerant of folks that continually say no. They say no. They say no. And after a while, we just sort of say, I, I, I can't do that anymore. But God never closes the door to us. You need to hear that this morning. I need to hear that. that when God offers us the option to say yes, and even when we say no, no matter how many times we've said no, God never, ever, ever closes the door completely on us. I love the picture. You remember the, some of the old movies we used to see of the old southern plantations that had that long driveway, the long oak field driveway that went up to the mansion. I love to, in this story, I love to think about that the father... Uh, comes out every day and he looks down that long road hoping that his son has come to his senses and is coming home and that every day without fail morning and afternoon he walks out and he looks just as far down that road as he can and he's straining his eyes to see if that that son that is left is coming home and one day one day, he comes out on the porch and looks, and off in the distance, I love this picture in my mind, that he sees in the distance and he's, he knows. He still can't make out exactly who it is. He can't see the features, but he can tell by the way the young man is walking. He can tell by the way he's carrying himself. He knows who it is, and so he jumps off the porch, and he's just running as hard as he can out toward the sun, weeping and crying, and the sun can't see that. And the son sees the dad leap off the porch and he says, oh, my Lord. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, so I'm taking some liberties here. But the son is thinking in his mind, oh, my Lord, he's coming to tell me to get off the property. He's coming to tell me I'm not welcome here anymore. He's coming to tell me that I'm not loved anymore, to get away from here. I'm no longer his son. Get away. And so the son, he's got this, he's got this, message prepared you know for, father forgive i don't want even i don't want to be known as your son anymore if you'll just let me come and let me just let me just live on the property because you treat your slaves better than i've been treated and he's already prepared all these things in his mind that he wants to say to his father and they're right on the tip of his tongue and dad's coming toward him and, and just as dad gets up he starts his speech and dad grabs him and says son i'm glad you're back I'm glad you're back. I've looked for you every day. I wanted you to come back every day. Son, I, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry that it took so long for you to get back. I'm glad you're back. And I imagine in my own little picture in my mind that they stood there for a moment and the son was so overcome that he didn't understand he couldn't comprehend that for just a moment, and all of a sudden he felt his father's tears running down the back of his neck, and all of a sudden it became very clear to him what was going on. And Dad said, I'm glad you're home. Some of us understand that story, don't we? We've been in that place where we've been in that far country, and we didn't know if we came back if we'd be welcome or not. And so we risk it. And we've started the journey back. Some of us may not be all the way back yet. We may be afraid to approach the throne of God. But God stands ready. But now we've got to deal with this other brother here in the picture. He stayed home. He's done exactly what he's supposed to do. He's been a good boy. But you know what? Neither one of these boys understood something. Everything that they had and everything that they would ever inherited, that would ever inherit belonged to their daddy. It wasn't theirs. They didn't, they didn't earn it. They didn't build it. They didn't create it. It belonged to him. And it was only the goodness of his heart that he was allowing them to even use it. But the oldest son, he copped an attitude pretty quick. I can't understand that, he said. This boy, is, he's ruined himself. He's made every bad choice in the world. Why in the world would you forgive him? Why in the world would you let him come back? Why in the world would you, let, would you even celebrate that? Daddy, I've been here working all of my life. Out of my sense of duty to you, I've given 
my life to you. Boy, that story sounds very familiar to me. Preacher, I've worked in the church all of my life. It owes me something. I've tried to do the best job. You know what? I'm, I'm more like the older brother, unfortunately, than the younger brother. Because, you know what? I have tried over the years in the sense, I, I, sometimes I get this sense of entitlement that I have. I'm entitled because I've, I've tried to be good. In some ways, I'm worse than the younger brother ever was. At least he knew what his problem was. Sometimes it's hard for me to see mine. Perhaps it's hard to see yours. But it was out of the Father's graciousness that he wanted both of these boys not to, not to, to live on like they were, but to be restored. To be restored and to be loved because they could be loved. We certainly can make some bad choices. Young people, there's choices in life that you're going to make that you're going to regret them. But don't ever let that stop you from asking forgiveness and moving ahead. Moving back in to being the person that you were intended to be. Your mom and dad have trained you up to be. And some of the, the rest of us, we need to understand that we're still on the journey. We've got choices we have to make. You know what? Some of you today are sitting here and, and you're wondering, should I go to Bojangles or Arby's for lunch? Where should I go for lunch? Does it make any difference? You see, we tend to not think about the important decisions, but there's brokenness in all of that. In all the choices we make, we have to deal with the brokenness that is part of our life. I heard a story one time about a teacher that uh, when her students were graduating from high school, she called each one of them forward and she said to them, your lives are going to touch, your choices are going to affect more than just you. Your choices are going to reach beyond you. It's going to affect other people. You're going to influence other people. You're going to lead other people. And she gave each one of those seniors a blue ribbon and said, I want you to take these blue ribbons and I want you to give a blue ribbon to the person that has influenced your life. And then I want you to give them the other two blue ribbons and, and have them pass them along to people that have influenced their life. And I just want you to see how far that influence reaches out. So the one young man in that class, he took one of those blue ribbons and he took it to a jun young junior executive that, that he had talked to, that had mentored him, that had talked to him about college. And he said, and he thanked the young man for sharing time with him to help him create a plan for his life. And then he gave him the other two blue ribbons and he said, I need for you to pass these on to others. I just need to know who you've passed them on to. So the young junior executive took his blue ribbon and he took it to a, his boss man who was a grumpy, grumpy, grumpy guy. But he was a great businessman. He never seemed to have any joy. He never seemed to have any, any real uh, thrill. He, he just seemed grumpy all the time. But this young executive went in and he gave him this ribbon and he says, I want to thank you for teaching me the principles of business and how to be a man of integrity in business. And the man seemed to soften just a bit. And he gave him the last blue ribbon and he said, I want you to pass this on to somebody that has influenced you, that has made a difference in your life, that means something to you, that, that really speaks to you in a very deep way. And that fellow took that blue ribbon, and on his way home that night, he decided who he would give it to. And he walked in the door, and he, he called his 14-year-old son into the room with him, and he said, Son, I want to give this ribbon to you. I don't spend a lot of time with you. It's, I just feel like I've got to work all the time in order to feed this family and to, make, to, to be as successful as I can. But I just want you to know, son, you're important to me. And the way you're the reason that I do a lot of the things I do. To which the son broke down weeping. 
and said to his dad, Dad, you'll never know what that means to me because I thought I was a disappointment to you. I thought you were ashamed of me. I didn't know. And with that, the father and son embraced and they, that relationship was restored. I want to invite you this morning to think about your life. I want to think about the choices you've made. I want you to think about the ways in which you said no or yes to God. It, this morning, if you've never said yes to God, God stands ready. You can never be so far away from home that God would not welcome you back. But you've got to start the journey. If there's brokenness in relationships and you've just made up your mind that there's, you know, this is the way it's got to be. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's not the way it's got to be. If God has extended you grace, can't you extend it to somebody else? I'd like to invite you this morning, if you'd like to pray about that, this altar is always open. If you'd like to come and pray, come. Kevin, would you come?